Jessica. Thanks for taking the time to learn more about human trafficking, specifically who is at risk and the tactics traffickers use to recruit, groom, and exploit others. In my time with Unbound, I've educated thousands of youth, school personnel, caregivers, medical professionals, community members, and more because I believe that through education and training, we can prevent this exploitation from happening and intervene when it does. Most trafficking situations start because a trafficker identifies the unmet needs or desires in a person's life and decides to exploit them. In labor trafficking, common risk factors include immigration status, low levels of education, a debt that needs to be paid off, or being economically disadvantaged. In many cases, labor trafficking victims are brought into a job under false pretenses and kept there through threats and violence. With sex trafficking, common risk factors include a history of previous abuse or exploitation, substance use, homelessness, mental illness, involvement in the commercial sex industry, and low socioeconomic status. With child sex trafficking, common risk factors are running away or homelessness, child sexual abuse, chronic abuse or neglect, identification as LGBTQ, learning disabilities, low socioeconomic status, developmental or cognitive delays, promotion of sexual exploitation by family members or peers, and a lack of personal safety, isolation, emotional distress, substance abuse, mental illness, and a lack of social support. One group that's often under-recognized in child sex trafficking is boys. Male sex trafficking victims may have an even lower chance of identification. Our culture often pictures males as perpetrators of sex crimes and females as victims of sex crimes. And there may even be a greater stigma or felt shame for boy victims that keeps them from reaching out. A study published by Love 146 indicated that male minors may comprise almost half of the commercially sexually exploited youth in our country, but they often go unidentified. The primary risk factor observed for underaged male victims is homelessness. Boys may be homeless because they were thrown out of the house or have run away due to family dysfunction, including abuse or familial substance abuse. Many youth who identify as gay or are transgender report having been thrown out of their homes or having experienced significant discrimination, including bullying and abuse. This puts them in an extremely vulnerable position for all sorts of victimization. One thing that may set boys apart is the prevalence of survival sex, often connected to the needs presented by homelessness. Boy victims may be recruited directly by buyers rather than a third-party trafficker. They're more likely to feel a sense of agency, like they are in control of the situation, therefore a boy victim may feel less like a victim. They are likely to be drawn in by a buyer offering to meet their needs and provide a sense of belonging. Let's watch this video that portrays the trafficking of a boy and how his friend notices suspicious behavior and takes action. Then we'll dive into the tactics traffickers use to recruit and groom victims. Oh my God, we Dude, got it. You finally got him. I know. Wait, how do you get that skin? That skin, it's on level three. Okay. It, <clears throat> um, what was that? It's, it's nothing, it's just something I do later. Okay. How do you get it? So level three, about midway through the level, there's a door. Um, I need to go. Okay. You sure? Yeah, yeah. Thanks for inviting me over. The tactics of traffickers can be broken down into four main themes. First, violence. 
traffickers may use violence or threats of violence against their victim or a victim's loved one. Second, lies or false promises. Traffickers may tell the victim that they are going to get a good job in a restaurant only to discover it's actually sex work. Traffickers may paint a dream of money, success, and freedom as bait. We've seen several situations where a pimp convinces a girl to work in a strip club to save up money and gain confidence for a modeling career. Soon after, the pimp forces her into selling sex. Traffickers may also befriend their victim, working to gain their trust. The trafficker may help the victim out, buying them what they want or need. Over time, however, the trafficker may start convincing the victim that they owe them and need to give something back. Lastly, traffickers may use romance to gain the love and devotion of the victim. According to Polaris Project, this tactic, called boyfriending, is the most common way traffickers initiate a relationship with a potential victim. An example of this last tactic is a survivor Unbound work with who we call Macy. On her 16th birthday, Macy was scrolling through her Facebook wall, enjoying the attention of the happy birthdays from dozens of friends, acquaintances, and several people she'd never met before. One message in particular caught her eye, a cute guy she didn't know wishing her a happy birthday with some compliments she hadn't heard in a while. They started messaging back and forth, and pretty soon Macy felt like she was in love. She'd never met someone who understood her so well, empathized with the depression she'd been dealing with, and made her feel so special and beautiful. After talking for a few months, they decided it was time to meet. Macy's mom was protective. As a single mom, she worked hard to make ends meet and raise her kids to be respectful and to focus on school. But one night, Macy snuck out to meet in person with this guy she'd grown so attached to online. That's when she realized the truth. He wasn't 19 like he said, he was 33. Macy was confused, but at this point she loved him enough to forgive his lie. He said he loved her, he wanted to be with her, that was enough. That's when her nightmare began. This man, who won her trust as her boyfriend, soon became her trafficker. Six months later, the Unbound Waco hotline rang. A desperate mother was calling for help. Her teenage daughter had been brutally trafficked, raped at gunpoint, beaten, and abused. With the complex trauma bonding caused by her abuse, her daughter, Macy, kept running away from home and going back to her trafficker. She knew her family was in danger, but she was about to give up hope. She'd been turned down for services too many times due to Macy's health conditions and limited space. Unbound was her final call. Thankfully, Unbound provides crisis response and relational case management to help any human trafficking victim find healing and rebuild a life of freedom. One common tactic of traffickers we see with youth is social media and online gaming, and that's why it's so important for adults to talk to youth about their online safety and monitor their online activity. Messaging and games allow traffickers to hide behind a screen, using whatever names and images they want to build a relationship with their victims. As in Macy's story earlier, the trafficker pretended to be someone else, building their relationship until she fell in love with him. Child predators and traffickers often use online gaming to groom their victims, especially boys. A predator may befriend a boy through messaging, then start to give him gifts like in-game items or credits. He may then use these favors to manipulate the child to send photos or videos. Once a trafficker has those, they can be used as blackmail to exploit the child further. Another major risk factor for trafficking is sexting. With the growth of messaging apps, sexting has become normal among teenagers. They may send a photo to someone they think they can trust and want to gain the favor of, like a crush or a boyfriend. From there, that person can use that image as blackmail. But it's not always a child on the other end. In February of 2019, a 30-year-old man in North Texas was arrested on charges of producing and receiving child pornography. This man was allegedly pretending to be a young girl with the handle hotgirl8887 on Instagram, and he was convincing young boys to send him nude photos. He would then ask them to commit sexual acts with younger siblings. If the child refused, he would threaten to send the photos to the parents of the child. 
one of his victims, a 12-year-old boy in North Carolina, became uncomfortable and told an adult, sparking the investigation and arrest. They found photos of other young boys on this man's computer. Everyone has unmet needs and desires. As a community, we need to be aware of those who have many of their basic needs going unmet. These members of our community are the most vulnerable to trafficking. We also must be aware of the role technology plays in drastically increasing the access of predators and traffickers to our young people. Social media apps, texting, and 24-7 contact put any person with a smartphone or web-connected device at risk of being approached by a trafficker. In a recent study of students who were educated through Unbound's youth prevention program called Keeping Students Safe, 15% of the participants indicated they recognized the tactics of a trafficker in people who approached them online. By educating yourself and others about the realities of human trafficking, you can be part of saving a life. Take a minute to add the National Human Trafficking Hotline to your phone so you're ready to make a report if needed. It's 1-888-373-7888. Or you can text HELP to 233-733. Then head to unboundnow.org to learn how you can be involved and support the work of Unbound. Hi, I'm Detective Joseph Scaramucci with the McLennan County Sheriff's Office. I've worked hundreds of trafficking cases over the past six years, and I want to share with you what I've learned about traffickers and buyers. First, we have to understand that human trafficking, like all industries generating profit, is about supply and demand. We know that the supply side of human trafficking is the victims, the people who are used and exploited. The demand side is the buyers, the people who are seeking to pay for the services provided by victims. And the person in the middle is the trafficker. The trafficker is a person who, through force, fraud, or coercion, is providing the victim to the buyer. So who are these sex traffickers? In sex trafficking, a trafficker may be better known as a pimp. Now take a minute and think about what comes to mind when you think of the word pimp. Based on music and movies, you probably have a pretty distinct image of what comes to mind. But as someone who has encountered and arrested a lot of pimps over the years, I have to tell you, most don't look like this. I'm about to show you a group of photos. Take 10 seconds and decide who you think the pimp is. You may have guessed it, but all of these people have been arrested for sex trafficking. In 2018, a Travis County, Texas woman conspired with her boyfriend to traffic a 14-year-old girl, lured the girl through Tagged, a social media app, used threats of force to make her perform sex acts, is now serving 40 years in prison. In 2018, a Houston, Texas man was running a massage business out of his home using a 15-year-old boy to give massages to clients. Paying customers were allowed to engage in sexual activities with that boy. He did this to multiple boys. He also tried to traffic this boy to the Summer Olympics in London in 2012. He's now serving a 30-year prison sentence. In 2016, a Waco man who was 51 years old harbored a 15-year-old runaway girl and charged men to have sex with her while keeping her high on heroin. He's now serving 12 consecutive life sentences. In 2018, a junior high teacher in a small town, Mahia, Texas, was accused of posting nude photos of her underage family member and arranging for multiple men in Morocco to have sex with her. In 2019, a former District of Columbia police officer who met two ninth grade girls online, 14 and 15 years old, and paid them to have sex with him. He pointed a gun at one of the girls, demanding his money back after she performed a sexual act. He's now serving 10 to 20 years in prison. From 2012 to 2015, a woman sold her 10-year-old daughter to a businessman multiple times over several years. He promised to pay the victim's tuition and provided the mother with expensive electronics and other gifts. The 67-year-old businessman was convicted of sex trafficking of a minor. As disturbing as it is to hear stories like this, these types of cases are really happening in the communities around America. These stories remind us that traffickers come in many forms. They could be from the United States or they could be from another country. They could be family members or partners of the victims or total strangers. Traffickers can be male or female. They could be individuals, part of an organized group, or gangs. Another group guilty of human trafficking is recruiters. A recruiter is used by a trafficker to find potential victims. These recruiters often seek out vulnerabilities that make a person easier to manipulate. 
Things like low self-esteem, history of abuse, running away from home, or unsupervised internet access increase a young person's vulnerability. Recruiters look for their victims in places where youth are often unsupervised. They might hang out at malls and parks, befriend youth in schools, or local libraries, meet runaway youth at a bus stop, youth shelters, or online. Even though a recruiter isn't the person directly selling or trafficking the victim, according to the law, they are still guilty of human trafficking. So we know traffickers and recruiters do what they do so they can make a profit, but who's driving the demand? The buyers. Like traffickers, buyers also come in many forms. Over the years, I've arrested more than 450 buyers in human trafficking stings. I picked up buyers as young as 17 years old and as old as 75. They come from every segment of society, they are married and single, businessmen, doctors, construction workers, and the unemployed just passing through or prominent community members. Most buyers are there because they, one, think it's a victimless crime, two, think they won't get caught, and three, have a sex addiction or feel unable to get their sexual needs met in any appropriate way. But the truth is this, there are very real victims whose lives are being destroyed through their actions. There are law enforcement like me looking to hold them accountable. Exploiting another person is never an acceptable way to have your needs met. A lot of these buyers also admit that the chain of events that led them to seeking to buy sex, and especially for those seeking sex with a minor, all started with an addiction to pornography. My job as a detective is to investigate these crimes and hold the perpetrators accountable, but I also care about the victims impacted by these crimes. That's why I depend on unbound advocates to be there to help the survivors get the care and support that they need. And whenever I train on human trafficking investigations around the country, I tell other law enforcement it's vital that they identify an agency in their community that can provide services to these survivors. So we talked about traffickers, recruiters, and buyers, but where does that leave you? As a member of your community, first of all, commit to not being part of the problem. Don't buy sex. Don't let yourself get on the slippery slope of pornography addiction, which leads so many people to buying sex. Don't exploit and don't take advantage of other people. Keep your eyes and ears open. If you see something suspicious, call the National Human Trafficking Hotline or your local law enforcement. If your community isn't educated about human trafficking, help organize an awareness event or advocate for education in your schools. If you have young people in your life, talk to them about trafficking, online safety, and pornography. Be a safe place for them when they screw up. And get involved with and donate to organizations like Unbound so they can continue to be there for the survivors that law enforcement recovers. Whatever you do, take action and be a part of the solution.
and I appreciate your interest in learning about human trafficking and understanding the people most impacted by this crime, the victims and survivors. In my work with Unbound, I serve trafficking survivors every day. At Unbound, in addition to our work preventing human trafficking and training our communities to respond, we provide 24-7 crisis response and relational case management services to victims and survivors. Over the years, we've seen firsthand that this crime impacts all types of people. We've served young children all the way up to survivors in their 50s. We have clients who are male, female, and transgender. Although most of our clients are U.S. citizens, we've served many survivors who are trafficked from other countries. Here's what's true of all survivors. They have faced unimaginable challenges and they've survived. Many victims are never identified because people simply don't know what to look for. Victims themselves may not understand what trafficking is, so they are unable to understand that that's what's happening to them. Fear, hopelessness, addiction, or the challenges of their lives may also keep them from reaching out for help. It's important that we know the signs to look for. Keep in mind that these signs don't necessarily mean it's human trafficking, and you may only see one or two in a trafficking victim. But when you find a constellation of these signs, or you have a gut instinct that something is wrong, it's important to take a closer look. In labor trafficking, you may notice that it seems someone is not free to come and go. Maybe they aren't in possession of their own money, ID, or documentation. They could work excessively long or unusual hours. Maybe they owe a large, unpayable, growing debt or were recruited through false promises. If you notice someone lacks access to basic needs or medical care, shows signs of violence or assault, or lacks knowledge of whereabouts, he or she could be a victim of labor trafficking. In sex trafficking, in addition to any of the signs of labor trafficking, you may notice someone is hiding bruises, scars, marks, or tattoos. Traffickers often brand their victims with tattoos as a sign of possession. Other red flags include frequent or unstable housing, involvement in the commercial sex industry, or being controlled or manipulated by another person. One survivor we've worked with in Central Texas was trafficked from the time she was 12 years old by a sophisticated trafficking ring. She still lived at home, went to church, and attended school. Because of the traffickers' threats that they'd hurt her sister if she didn't do what they say, she kept her head down, not showing any of these signs. She did well in school and tried to stay under the radar. She did try to tell an adult what was happening one time, but when they reacted negatively, this reinforced her fear and she lived under the control of the traffickers for years. In most situations, however, there will be some key signs for child sex trafficking. Traffickers often make their victims work at night while still in school or take them to other cities to work on the weekends. Look out for students who are skipping school, running away, or traveling a lot. Traffickers often isolate their victims from their friends and families and try to change them as much as possible to create a new identity. That makes it a lot harder for them to reach out for help. Look for people who start hanging out with a different group, start talking really differently about things like sex, partying, and drugs, or who start dressing differently. For example, if a student shows up to school with possessions you know they can't afford, or maybe a female student always has her nails and hair done, this could be a sign of grooming. If you see someone start dating or spending time with someone who is much older, that could be a sign. Or if someone is being controlled or manipulated by another person and isn't allowed to make their own choices or go where they want. If someone starts talking about unusual sexual experiences or selling sex acts, that's a red flag. Traffickers and buyers are often really violent with their victims. If you notice someone hiding bruises, cuts, or scars, that's a red flag. A pimp may force his victim to get a tattoo to show that he or she is the pimp's possession, like the pimp's name, a money bag, barcode, or something else that indicated a trafficking situation. If a young person is acting out sexually, exhibiting aggressive anger, or doing the opposite, appearing withdrawn or reclusive, this could be a sign of exploitation, especially if this is different from their normal behavior. 
A person who is using drugs or involved in a gang is also more likely to be vulnerable for sex trafficking. Remember, a person who is being trafficked may not show any of these signs at all, doing their best to keep their head down or not draw attention for fear of the trafficker. But if you feel like something is wrong, take a minute to check in and ask. Before we talk about the barriers to identification and pathway to recovery, let's watch this brief video. In it, you'll see a community member noticing red flags that make her suspicious that a child's mother may be trafficking her. Hey, I think I'm lost. Oh, do you know where you are? I'm in this cul-de-sac. Oh, okay. Yeah, I know my house is kind of hard to find. Hey, can I call you back? Yeah. Kyla. In the house. Come on now. We don't got all day. I'm so glad that community members are keeping their eyes open and taking action. In a case like this one, law enforcement could investigate, call Unbound or another service provider in your community, and we could help this girl get to safety and start her healing journey. Unfortunately, victims often go unnoticed and don't seek help for themselves, and there are a number of reasons why. In labor trafficking, it's a little more straightforward. Victims are often kept extremely isolated and their exploiters keep them from seeking help through threats and violence. Many may not have legal documentation and the fear of deportation keeps them from seeking help. For sex trafficking victims, the reasons may be even more complex. Many victims may fear not being believed, may feel shame about what happened to them, or fear retaliation from their trafficker. They may also think they themselves will be in trouble with the law and want to avoid criminal charges. They may believe that the exploitation they're experiencing isn't as bad as what could face them if they sought help. Or they may fear getting a family member in trouble. They may also be facing threats or blackmail from their trafficker. Because of the abuse and lifestyle that often comes with trafficking, they may be confused or disoriented or have developed a substance dependency, which the trafficker will use to control the victim. The most complicated barrier to identification and recovery is what's called trauma bonding. Trauma bonding happens when an abuser uses a combination of fear and abuse with romantic attraction and affection to create a strong emotional bond in his victim. This is often seen in victims of domestic violence as well and has a strong neurological impact on victims. It is not uncommon to hear in victims the sentiment, I hate what he does to me, but I love him and cannot leave him. In many ways, this psychological bondage can be more powerful than a physical constraint. But here's the good news. There is hope. As our communities are becoming more aware and equipped to respond, more and more survivors are both reaching out for help and being identified and recovered than ever before. An educated community creates a better environment for outcries and identification. Every survivor has the potential to heal and build a life of freedom. In fact, many survivors also want to give back by becoming survivor leaders, helping shape the response to human trafficking, hosting support groups, and sharing their stories. The path to restoration, however, can be a long and difficult process. After recovery, the first step is to assess the needs of a survivor and work with them to create a recovery strategy for their unique needs. Some have a safe and supportive home environment to return to, and some do not. Recovery is a process that takes time, patience, and hope. When trafficking survivors courageously choose to work through the trauma of their experiences, they find healing. They rediscover their own dreams, goals, and strengths. They rediscover themselves. 
By educating yourself and others about the realities of human trafficking, you could be part of saving a life. Take a minute to add the National Human Trafficking Hotline to your phone so you're ready to make a report if needed. It's 1-888-373-7888, or you can text the word HELP to 233-733. Then head to unboundnow.org to learn how you can be involved and support the work of Unbound.